Well, good morning, everybody. It's fantastic to be with you, especially here with Thupton Jimpa, who is kind of a mystery man. You know, it's like everybody around the world recognizes him as the man at the side of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, whispering into his ear. And then His Holiness always says these amazing things that people are hanging on to every word. And sometimes I've wondered, are those your words or his words that he's saying? (laughs) So we're so delighted that you're part of of the festival here. And we've been having wonderful talks, obviously, His Holiness, uh, principal value that we spoke about, really that inspired our city, is the uh, value of compassion. Uh, We call it the human value and how all of us here in this room and those of us that have the beauty of having leadership positions use our pulpit Uh, to preach every day, if you will, around these human values of kindness and compassion, love and hospitality. And those are what bind us all as human beings. We're born with these. And then people kind of get caught up in the secondary differences, it seems like, that attempt to pull our cities and our country and our world apart. So we're just going to have a conversation. And Jim Paul, so I'd like to ask you a few things. I mean, one of the things that you said is... uh, quote, compassion, it really opens a whole new door to the way of being in the world. And you've traveled the world with His Holiness. And can you talk to us a little bit about what you meant when you wrote that? Um, I mean, of course, I've had the privilege to serve His Holiness for such a long time. And also, um, originally, having brought up as a monk, um, you know, I had the privilege to also uh, try to live according to that value. Um, So, of course, you know, my thinking and my belief, my own way of life has been heavily shaped by, you know, the inspiration of His Holiness. Uh, what I see in compassion is actually uh, a very important human resource that often we neglect, you know, to our own kind of, you know, peril. Because, um, you know, what I find f- fascinating about compassion is actually the role it can play in motivation. Because when we act, we have all sorts of motivations, motivations of a sense of justice or outrage or jealousy or greed. Or... But compassion is also part of that. But if we choose compassion to be our key motivating factor, say, for example, in our relationship with our children, the way we treat our colleagues at work, and, and, and so on, it changes everything. Because then you are free from this heaviness of self-agenda and defensiveness and judgment. And you have a kind of a clarity. And I often say that, um, you know, if you are struggling with a moral issue, the clearest way to think through this is to ask, what is the most compassionate thing to do here? It really has an amazing ability to be so clear. And this is what I mean. When you choose compassion, it really opens you know, a whole new set of doors. Well, so this is something that, you know, when we've talked about it here, some people say, well, that that sounds great, but it sounds soft. And, you know, we don't live in a soft world, and so it's too touchy-feely, and we can't get things done. I mean, how do you respond to that? Well, actually, I mean, you know this. I mean, you, uh, you know, one of the things that I really admire about you is um, you as the mayor of a, a major city in North America, has made the conscious choice to make compassion as an explicit value by which you will exercise your leadership of this city. And in the end, we realize that regardless of how important federal level governments are or state level governments are, in actual reality, people's lives are impacted by what happens in the city in which they live. And the reality of the modern world is that most of us tend to live in urban areas. So the kind of leadership that you are exercising really makes a huge difference. And you know by choosing compassion, you are not saying people can get away with everything they do. You know, I mean, you have, you want to make sure that the individuals take responsibility for their action. There is a law and order. There is accountability to people's work. But at the same time, you find place for compassion to be a powerful voice. So you know that compassion is not a touchy-feely thing. Yeah, there's compassion at the individual level, but we have to have compassion to the system, right? In this case, the system is our city, 
And we define compassion as respect for citizens so that their human potential is flourishing. Sure. But that can only happen in a context where a system is flourishing. Definitely. So if there's, uh, let's say, let's talk a little bit about violence and compassion. You know, we have uh, increasing problems of violent crime in three quarters of American cities right now, uh, mainly due to the scourge of opioids and heroin. And uh, how do we go about to exercise this value of compassion within this kind of environment? And so to me, we have a, a systemic or a citywide view where there must be justice. There has to be individual accountability for it as well for the overall system of compassion to flourish. Does that make sense? Yes, actually, I wanted to ask you questions so that it's not just <laughs> uh, you know, me at the receiving end. Um, you know, I mean, um, you know, you were there at this very important, you know, mayor's conference in Indianapolis last year. Um, so I was kind of curious because you and one of the few mayors have chosen to declare your city as a compassionate city or a city of kindness. So I'm, you know, my curiosity is, you know, I'm sure that the mayors of other larger cities are intrigued. So when they asked you questions. You know, what do you say? What does it mean for a, an important, a large city like Louisville to be declared as a city of compassion? What do you say to that? <laughs> I usually chuckle like that at the beginning. Uh, a lot of people don't understand it. Um, in this world of elected officials, many people, uh, I have a business background and I've always run our businesses so that compassion is at the heart of that with, again, the respect for all of our employees, our citizens, so that our companies are platform for human potential to flourish. So this concept is a city concept with the city as a platform for human potential to flourish. And so everything we do works up around that. So we make our decisions first through values of lifelong learning, health, physical, mental, environmental, spiritual health, and then compassion, this respect notion that we talked about. So I haven't found anybody that disagrees with it. When we talked about it at the beginning in, in my inaugural address, some people said, that's soft, that seems weird. Uh, you know, politicians are supposed to be hard and tough and compassion is soft and weak. And I said, well, actually, it's harder to be compassionate than it is to be a cynic from the couch somewhere. So let's get with it here. It's an action word. So, but then we say, how do we bring it to life? Now, so because if it's just uh, theory and philosophy, as you know, it doesn't work as you integrate how to build a city. So uh, we bring it to life, and this is usually what I talk about with the uh, mayors. First, do something symbolic. It has to be in your heart, but then sign the Charter for Compassion, for instance, but then get started. Do something. So the first thing we started was service work. It's the most basic thing that everybody understands. It connects people from different parts of town. Uh, makes people feel good Definitely. when they serve and love other folks, lead to other good activity. We're in our give a day week of service right now, as a matter of fact. And last year we had 175,000 volunteers in acts of compassion. This morning I started off with an event where we had 300 volunteers going to help in the Shawnee neighborhood of our city. They all showed up despite the rain and cold weather out today because of the drive for compassion, I think, was very positive. Uh, so that's the most basic form, but then we've matured into the area of education, in particular focusing on our youngest uh, citizens. When you think about some of our disadvantaged kids that come from basically post-traumatic stress environments, food insecure, housing insecure, very likely would have been around violence, and they show up at our kindergartens and we drop them off to a teacher and say, okay, now teach this kid. That's a disservice to education, it's a disservice to our teachers. So we started the Compassionate Schools Project so that we could teach nutrition, wellness, mindfulness, so kids could learn empathy, compassion for selves, compassion for others as well, and it's increased educational outcomes and human potential as well. So I, I go to the specific areas with these yes. mayors to say, here's how you bring it to life. And I know His Holiness's uh, emphasis has been on education a lot. Definitely, yeah. So, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry to um, say that His Holiness has not been able to come to this year's Festival, Festival of Faiths. He was looking forward to it. And yesterday, listening to the presentation on the Compassionate Schools, and there was a lunch uh, where Ausley actually 
explained much more detail about what's happening. Um, I felt that what a pity that the Solonists would have really been so impressed and pleased um, by what you have achieved in a compassionate um, schools project because, you know, I mean, there, the fact that there is such a scale, so many schools are involved. UVA is involved and some of the local universities are also involved in the evaluation and research side. So all of this is probably been made possible because there is, from your office, a kind of a, a very strong support of the whole notion of compassion as a guiding principle and value. So um, I told Ausley that I wanted a, a one-page summary of the Compassionate Schools project so that I could uh, inform His Holiness that a lot of good work is being done because, um, you know, His Holiness uh, has, has, you know, great fondness for you, you know, those who see the two of you interact immediately notice this. And, and because he sees you as someone who actually makes the ideal of compassion real in people's lives. So let me take this opportunity to thank you and congratulate you for your leadership. Yeah. Maybe, um, I mean, one thing, uh, you know, I'm a Canadian, so I'm on the other side of the border, the northern side, the colder part of North, <laughs> North America. Um, one of the things that, uh, you know, we have noticed um, lately, particularly in, in, in the U.S., is this um, increasing kind of, you know, discourse that has to do with the relationship between communities and um, authorities, and particularly now kind of, you know, law and order authorities. Uh, there have been some tragic situations. So, um, you know, my hope is that Louisville, with an explicit espousal of compassion as a guiding principle of the city, maybe um, it could set an example of how, even in the case of difficult relationships, like law and order and community relations, maybe there's a way in which compassion can play a role. Do you see that a possibility? I, I hope. I mean, the, the, one of the biggest challenges is to get people to think. It came out in our last example as well, our last panel as well. You have to stop and say, why are things happening the way they are? And it's because our, the systems that we have in place, policies, procedures, and laws, have produced a certain out effect. When you look at the root of most injustice, whether it's on the violence side or lack of opportunity side, it stems from poverty. So when you take a look and say, why is there poverty? And you take a look at our institutions, our structures, and the history behind those, uh, many of them were not developed to uh, produce uh, access, equity. And so we have this growing gulf between those that have it and those that don't. In many cases, it's multi-generational. In many uh, cases, it's a result of racial policies that have been put in place in our country. Of course, we have the stain of slavery as part of the history of America. And we can't do anything about that, but we can change systems moving forward. When you have multi-generational poverty, especially in urban areas, uh, if your family has never been able to integrate into education, into healthcare, because the systems were not there for That's you to do it. And you hear people saying, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. The reality is a lot of people don't even know where the shoe store is. Okay, so. So, so we're investing in the wrong place. For the young boy that I talked about that's showing up three years behind in kindergarten, why aren't we investing in him from prenatal to age six, as a society, we seem to be okay to invest in incarceration and after the fact. That's true. In healthcare. <laughs> so the same, same with healthcare, education, it goes on and on. So I, th I think that we are at the beginning stage of some type of change in the social contract that we have here in America because our system right now is not sustainable in terms of equity and opportunity for everybody. The results are too varied. If I can't convince people through the heart that it's the right thing to do for everybody to have a shot at success, then we need to talk about the economics. We're gonna be a majority minority country in 2040. 
Where's the workforce going to come from if people don't have access and equity? And if I can't convince you on that, then the other argument is pub public safety. Uh, the riots that took place in our country post-Ferguson, uh, while they're initiated by an officer-involved shooting, what the street is saying, the street is saying, I feel disconnected, I feel hopeless to a positive future. We cannot build a great country around that. And the street will react, just like you saw in the Middle East, and it has been. So there will be an awakening. The question is how much pain and frustration between now and then. So I'm optimistic, and there's other countries, as you know, that are showing us sure. the way. So we've got to look at our systems. So it looks like um, that kind of change really is most effective when it's really at the grassroots level, right. from a level of city. So this is why I think His Holiness was particularly inspired by you know, a few of you really adopting compassion as an explicit value um, because there is a real chance. So the question I have is that after having declared compassion as a kind of a key value and Louisville as a compassionate city, have you been able to attract some of the businesses <laughs> into the city so that they feel somehow they can sort of be imbued by these kind of values? Yes, and this is the last question I'm gonna allow you to ask me. <laughs> I'm supposed to be interviewing him. <laughs> I'm the local guy. They hear from me all the time. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, the Compassionate Louisville Partnership, and I'm sure we have some folks here. You know, we have Education Constellation, Healthcare Constellation, uh, Business Constellation. Tom Williams has been very uh, uh, important oh, by in By the that. way, I was very impressed by the amount of corporations that have supported the Compassionate uh, School yes. Project. Yeah. Corporations, we have over 100 people that have signed, companies that have signed our Charter for Compassion. Computer Share is a big company here. Uh, we'll have over 1,000 employees in the next couple of years. We were competing with 40 other cities. Uh, great company. I asked the CEO, uh, why did you end up selecting Louisville? You know what he said? I loved your city's focus on compassion. Wow. <laughs> this is... So compassion is good for business. <laughs> it is. And, and I can say, lack of compassion is bad for business as well. So however you enter the conversation, it's all about, we were saying earlier, uh, Jim Paul didn't know that Thomas Merton had his epiphany at 4th and Walnut, now Muhammad Ali, just blocks away from here. And so high performers understand that interdependence and interconnection is essential. And of course, the most highest performing entity is Mother Nature, right? And so, and when we don't, uh, please her, bad things happen. And this, of course, is what we were talking about as well. But you've had an extraordinary life from a young boy in Tibet that met his holiness in northern India when you were eight years old? Six years Six yeah. years old. You were selected to greet him when he came to your school, walked out of the school holding hands with him. And who knew what your life was going to become from from Tibet to northern India to Buddhist monk to England to Montreal to over 30 years translating for His Holiness. And what a ride uh, you've been on to have this great perspective of what the world has to offer. So in our closing two minutes here, uh, would, you, would you mind just sharing with us all this exposure you've had to everything? What are the top learnings that you've learned from His Holiness? Well, um, you know, I have been very, very fortunate, although, um, you know, a victim of uh, what happened to Tibet tragically in 1959 with His Holiness having to escape to India. My parents joined that uh, Tibetan exodus. exodus. Um, but although I grew up as a, a refugee kid uh, in the Indian, um, in, in India, in the Tibetan community, but I've been very, very lucky. And um, I often tell uh, my friends and my wife as well, um, Many of us have the illusion that somehow we have some control over our life. Uh, but the fact is, the most important things in your life, you, you don't choose. You don't choose your parents. <laughs> and also, the person who you end up you know, living your life with, often you don't choose because you fall in love. Similarly, um, with His Holiness, it was not really a choice. I didn't really have a grand plan for my life. It just unfolded, and I was wise enough to follow the path that opened in front of me. <laughs> That's the only wisdom I can claim. Um, but with His Holiness, one of the things that I have really uh, learned a lot from him is the importance of um, 
remembering that life is as much about suffering, challenges, and problems as about joy and happiness and fulfillment. Um, we sometimes forget. People who are serious, who are committed, who are dedicated to a cause, forget the joy side of things. And with His Holiness, you can see in him, here is a man who's totally at ease in his skin. In his own skin, he's, he's who he is, he's what you see in front of you. There's a kind of a relaxedness. So this being able to combine dedication, effort, facing the challenge, you know, feeling for the world in pain, sharing the pain, at the same time being joyful, celebrating life, you know, really celebrating your fellowship with other human beings. That kind of maintaining the optimism um, is, is so important, and this is something that I've learned from His Holiness. And what about the laugh? Exactly. I mean, he has a tremendous sense of humor. We all know. I mean, it's like, uh, it's quite infectious. Yeah. Well, and so when he visited the first time, they said, don't, don't touch his holiness. Uh, you know, that's, he's a very important and holy man. You know, make sure you, you stay away. <laughs> and then he walks in the room and he throws his arms open. And he has a big belly laugh and he starts hugging everybody. It was very confusing. <laughs> Well, the Tibetans, you know, we, we, you know, we see him as the human manifestation of the Buddha of compassion. So, of course, the Tibetans have this deep reverence. So, uh, people around him try to somehow protect him, but then he is who he is, you know. Yeah, <laughs> He's no. just basically a human being who just likes physical contact and, and just to be joyful. Yes. Well, it's been such a blessing. Uh to have a relationship with His Holiness, and we see Him as such a uh, motivation for our city to do better. We will redouble our efforts as a city of I think compassion. he will be very pleased to hear about the report that you will have to give it to him. Well, then let's bring him back to Louisville. Exactly. How's that sound? <laughs>